I'm 47 and my wife is 45. We've been married for 22 years and we have three kids, a 20-year-old son and two daughters, 18 and 16. On September 11, 2001, my wife had planned to meet a man she met online at a nearby hotel. They had been texting and exchanging pictures for months. At that time, we had been married for two years and our son was not even a year old. The only thing that stopped her from going through with the meeting was the Trade Center attack. Her uncle was on the 84th floor of the South Tower, and it was almost certain he died on impact. The entire country was mourning, and she took it hard. I sympathized with her and was there to console her. After some crying, she confessed her plan, expressed regret, and showed me proof that they hadn't gone beyond emotional conversations. Before her confession, I had a gut feeling something was wrong, but I never thought it would be an emotional affair. This shocked me because I had always believed she wasn't that type of person. She had grown up in a sheltered environment, and I didn't expect this from her. She explained that she had felt like she missed out on things due to her strict upbringing. When we started our relationship, she told me I was her first, and I believed her. However, after her confession, I began to question what else she might have been hiding. If not for the events of September 11th, she might have gone through with the affair, and I would never have known. The fact that she came clean without me finding out contributed to my willingness to reconcile with the condition that she get counseling. Additionally, I saw no proof of a physical affair. I remembered how much the entire experience crushed me. Despite canceling her plan, she was remorseful and did the right things. And although it took a long time, the pain eventually faded into a memory. However, trust was never fully restored. I viewed it like a piece of paper. Once crumpled, it could never be perfectly smooth again. The experience left me scarred, even as we reconciled. I had to keep checking on her, and she passed those checks, smoothing things out somewhat, but trust was never perfect again. Then, 19 years later, on October 14, 2019, things took a turn again. That day, she had an argument with our 18-year-old daughter. Later that day, I made our daughter laugh, but my wife, still upset, left the house and turned off her location sharing, raising my suspicions. The trust that had never fully restored now needed reassurance. I began trying to check her phone, computer, and anything else that might be helpful. The next day, we had to get a passport for our youngest at the post office. My wife seemed aloof and was constantly on her phone. I made a mental note to check it out later. Usually, she left her phone around, but lately, she had been carrying it everywhere. That unsettled feeling was creeping back. We had bought her an iPad, and she locked it with a passcode, which surprised me, since we never use passcodes. When I asked, she said it was for work, but I couldn't shake my doubts. On Friday, we closed on a home equity loan at the bank. She said she had to run an errand afterward, and when I checked her locations, I saw one stop was at an adult store. I later found a nice piece of lingerie she had bought, and I thought it might be for us, but our intimate life had been stagnant. Her interest in us physically had dwindled. My curiosity led me to monitor her more closely, and I finally got the passcode to her iPad. That's when I discovered explicit Facebook messages with a guy. Even though they weren't Facebook friends, the messages were clearly inappropriate. When he suggested she drop off our daughter and come over, she declined, saying, My stories aren't set up like that. I confronted her that evening, which turned out to be a mistake. I should have held on to that information and gathered more, but I confronted her too soon. She lied, taking the affair underground. She claimed the lingerie was for us, saying she was building up the courage to wear it for me. She also said the guy on Facebook was a summer coworker who started messaging her out of the blue, and she swore there was no physical contact, just texting. I wanted to believe her, but it was hard. I insisted that it had to end completely, and she agreed. The next day, I asked if it had ended, and she said yes. But unbeknownst to her, I could still see their messages through other means. She lied. Now, after 19 years, I find myself in the same position again. My emotions are a mess. I can't eat or sleep, and I have a hard time concentrating. I'm starting counseling this week and hitting the gym more, but this situation sucks. I don't want to go through it. I've been reading The 180 almost daily since D-Day, and I pulled it off well for a couple of days, but today was rough. I got almost no sleep last night. Our son, who works at a local theater, 
gave us tickets to see Come From Away. We had to pretend everything was great so we wouldn't disappoint him. At 20, he's a great kid. If you're not familiar with the show, it deals with the Trade Center story, and it was tough to sit through. I've been keeping a journal, noting dates, times, and my thoughts. I've come up with a mantra. Keep cool. Keep patient. Keep control. I've been trying to be more consistent in how I handle things, and it's something I've been working towards. Lately, I've been in a better headspace. We had to go shopping tonight, and I wanted to practice the 180 as best as I could. Fast forward to July 3rd, 2021, when my investigation revealed that my wife had been in contact with other men through the summer school program where she works as a teacher's aide. One of these men was a 32-year-old gym teacher. My wife, at 47, was about 15 years older than him, which made her, as some would say, a cougar. The gym teacher works at a nearby school while his wife works at a different school in another district. My wife met him while they were both working at summer school, a program that involves teachers from several districts. I found out he would be there again. So I observed quietly and eventually caught a suggestive Facebook message between them. Interestingly, he rejected her, which gave me a bit of a chuckle. I've come to believe that he sees her as a friend and doesn't want to get involved. I'm not completely done with my investigation but I feel like I can see the end from here. Given the magnitude of this life change, I need to be certain before I make any decisions. I've set up an Intel network using voice-activated recorders, GPS tracking, electronic passcodes, and so on. My goal is to gather as much incontrovertible proof as possible before pulling the trigger. I've also been reading up on divorce laws in my state and will be contacting lawyers soon. Some of my friends have been through recent divorces and I plan to ask them for advice. One of the hardest things I've ever done is collecting DNA samples from my three children just to make sure they are mine. Regardless of the results, I will love them unconditionally, but I needed the peace of mind. As for what I'm waiting for, I go back and forth between thinking we're done and maybe there's still hope. I feel like I need something to hit me in the face, something undeniable. It hasn't happened yet, but I don't want to put my kids through the pain of divorce unless it's clear-cut. There's a part of me that morbidly enjoys hearing her complain on the voice-activated recorder about the latest developments, like when the gym teacher unfriended a lot of people recently. Yes, I snooped again, and she wasn't happy about it. I know this isn't going to go over well, but she's been going through what I call a midlife crisis for the last year or so. She also lost her mom back in November, and we're having the funeral tomorrow. She's taking it very hard. Two days after her mom passed, we lost my dad, and over the next three weeks, she lost two more relatives. Then it was Christmas. My family has faced a lot of tragedy recently, and it's deeply affected her. In the back of my mind, I thought maybe her behavior was a result of all these events. I wondered if I should create some space between our losses and the potential pain of divorce. I'm willing to endure it a bit longer for my kids and family. Holding out before making a final decision is tough. After 26 years together, giving up isn't easy, especially considering the depth of love I've felt for her throughout most of our marriage. But I can't ignore the reality of what's happening. My plan is to spend this week checking out divorce attorneys. We have a birthday party for my daughter next Sunday, and after that, I plan to confront my wife. I'm not sure exactly what I'll say, but I'll let her know that I've consulted an attorney and I'm ready to proceed with a divorce. While I'd love for her to have some realization moment, I can't continue the marriage after gathering this evidence. On February 11, 2022, I installed a voice-activated recorder in her car. Listening to the recordings made me take note of the effects I'd feel and how to deal with them. Sleeplessness, use PM and melatonin, nervous energy, hit the gym, lack of appetite, use it to knock off some extra pounds, difficulty concentrating. Write everything down and recite common tasks. I even forgot about night sweats until they happened. Then I prepared by having towels and fresh clothes ready. Relief came knowing I no longer had to spy or walk on eggshells. Before I confronted her, she had been treating me like everything was wonderful in our lives. For the last few months, she had been upset about receiving a box of her late mother's things from her dad to sort through. Strangely, it didn't affect me. I felt no sympathy, grief, or sorrow seeing her upset. When the confrontation finally happened, she kept pushing me, asking, what's wrong? 
Tell me what's bothering you. All I had to do was say his name and the words. I know. She got flustered and stormed out of the house. I don't have to worry about her anymore. I no longer feel on edge when she's around, as if I had to act a certain way or accomplish specific tasks to keep things calm. As for the recent developments with her, something seemed off. We were getting along too well, and she was almost too nice to me. Things that would normally annoy her didn't seem to bother her at all. At first, I thought she was finally happy, but eventually, it nagged at me, and I decided to become the marriage police again. I reinstalled a voice-activated recorder in her car and placed a GPS tracker there too. It didn't take long. On my first try, I caught something. The recording revealed two phone calls. The first was with him as she was driving out to meet him. They ended up in a church parking lot for about 40 minutes. She went to his car, so I was spared having to listen to that. The next call was to her sounding board friend, who lives halfway across the country. If the call to him wasn't enough, and I could have found some wiggle room to keep my blinders on, the call to her friend sealed the deal. When we finally had the conversation, it was the usual story, gaslighting and blame shifting. According to her, the affair was my fault because she resents the things she never got to do in life. She didn't go to college or have a wild single life before we got married. And of course, she blames me for that. She resented me for it. I told her I refused to accept her idea that her affair was my fault. I had told her a while ago that if she wanted out, then let's end it. But she chose to stay. So no, this is all on her. I will accept some responsibility for not being the perfect husband, but I certainly wasn't married to the perfect wife. I didn't deserve this. Now, I'm calling a few divorce friends for attorney recommendations and any strategic advice they might have. I am finally ready to end it. I finally learned my lesson. My wayward wife has shown she doesn't deserve what it would take to reconcile. And I don't want to sign up for another affair in a few months or years. I'm joining the divorce side. Maybe there's some secret handshake I should learn? I'm still in a whirlwind of emotions. I punched a wall. But luckily, neither the wall nor I got hurt. I yelled forget her, loudly in my house, but thankfully no one was home. When my best friend called to check on me, I broke down sobbing. I sometimes daydream about a magical reconciliation. I wonder, would it be so bad if we stayed together? Maybe if I tried a little harder, she'd be happy. But deep down, I know this is nonsense, and getting a divorce is the right move. I've told this to my mom my friends, and myself many times in the last few days since D-Day. We've mostly avoided each other since then, and I really miss her. We used to text during the day, share our work experiences, and exchange random hugs and kisses at home. All of that has stopped. We avoid each other in the house now. She sleeps on the couch instead of the bed. One of my simple pleasures in the morning was gently waking her up when our alarm went off by rolling over, rubbing her back or arm, and whispering, Hey honey, it's that time. Her almost inaudible response always brought a smile to my face. She hasn't left yet, and we haven't officially split, but I know what I have to do. I just know it won't be easy. I keep telling myself there has to be light at the end of this long, dark, and lonely tunnel. Our children have had the opportunity to travel and do some pretty cool things through their involvement in a musical group. She's jealous because she never got to do any of that. Newsflash, neither did I. But I'm not jealous. I'm happy my kids have more than I did. For the last 20 years, I played in a fairly popular local band. We performed at some pretty nice events, but she's jealous of those opportunities too. She dismisses the hours of practice and study it took for me to get to that level. I can't count the number of times she shared stories with me about people she met at work who had heard of our band. It was like she felt special being married to one of the members. Once, she even spoke to someone in the doctor's office after overhearing them talk about a gig we were playing that night. She complained that I left her alone with the kids when I went out to perform, but I was working. I came home with money in my pocket. Yes, I had fun because playing music in front of people is exhilarating, but I was also managing things like dealing with bar owners, keeping track of timing, and gauging crowd reactions. It wasn't always fun. On top of that, I was waking up at 5 a.m., working a full day, then gigging and not getting home until 2 a.m. It made for long, exhausting days. I did it because we needed the money, especially since we were building the house she wanted. Leaving the group wasn't an option. 
She worked too, but I earned almost as much just gigging as she did at her regular job, which made her upset. My day job paid three to four times more than hers. I worked hard to give my family the life I thought they deserved, and what I got in return was resentment. The old saying, when someone shows you who they really are, believe them the first time, is true. It took me too long to see who I had married. I came to the same conclusion. If we stay together, I'm signing up for more of the same, being blamed, resented, and kept at a distance. I've gotten a couple of attorney references, and we'll be setting up appointments soon. I just don't see a path forward that doesn't end in divorce. There's really nothing left to work with. The funny thing is, people who know her outside of the home think she's a wonderful person, warm, caring, a terrific mom who goes above and beyond to help others. And she is like that, but inside the house, it's a different story. She's definitely suffered from what I call poor me syndrome. She's had a co-worker who's married to another co-worker, helping her through all of this. I haven't told her family. She only has her dad and his sister left. I don't talk to them much, but I might tell them eventually. I've also reached out to the other betrayed spouse, but she hasn't responded. I'll send another email in a few days with more details. And if I don't hear back, I'll leave it alone. Tonight, I told my wife I want a divorce. She wanted a hug and to cry, but those days are over. She understood, and we wistfully talked about how we wish things had been different. I asked her, didn't you realize this was going to happen when you were doing it? She did, but she's still very upset. I feel bad because I still love this woman, but I can't be with her anymore. I don't want to do this, but I have to. A few years down the road, I know I'll feel better knowing I'm free. The band is on hiatus at the moment, but I have a few irons in the fire to keep me playing. We play classic rock with horns, Chicago, and similar music. I play trumpet, and I have my sights set on that day when everything will be behind me. I know I'm starting down a rough road, but I'm confident I'll come out in good shape. She left the door open for counseling, but I shut it down. I did urge her to get counseling anyway, for herself. The only thing I can blame myself for right now is not ending things earlier. I've done nothing else wrong in the last few years. On the contrary, I've tried to be the model husband and make her the most important thing in my life. And yet, here I am again. I keep wanting to save my marriage, but then I remember why I can't. It's a sad thing, really. And as much as anything else, it shows me that I'm ready to let go. I reached out to the other betrayed spouse via email, but got no response. On advice from a different thread, I called her and broke the news. I've never felt like such a mess in my life. I know I didn't do anything wrong by telling her what she needed to know, yet she was heartbroken, and I felt responsible. It was like finding out all over again. I broke the poor woman's heart. I know I didn't, but she thanked me. That wasn't easy. We talked more, and I'll guide her to this site for support. It helped me greatly. I also told her that, even though we've never met, I'll be there for her. She can call or text me anytime. She was helpful to me too, comparing notes and making sense of the situation. I just got off the phone with her, and I feel much better about telling her now. She thanked me, and I feel I did the right thing, even though it was hard. We chatted more, and I'll direct her to this site for support. It has been a great help for me. I assured her that I'm here for her, even though we haven't met. She can call or text me anytime. She was helpful to me, too, in comparing notes and making sense of the situation. I just finished a phone call with her and feel better about opening up. She thanked me, and I believe I did the right thing. It was tough, but I wanted to hear about his behavior. He seemed to create a story of an unhappy marriage to gain sympathy. I'm not ignoring her role, but she might have been manipulated with things she wanted to hear. My wife is unaware that I exposed the affair, which affects two families and six children. Looking at a parent and wondering how they could do that is tough. Just have her compare paychecks. This has been happening. I only talk to her about kids or household matters and mostly avoid being in the same room as her. The house is cold, and she's slowly realizing she's gone too far. I'm calling lawyers, gathering friends for support, and making plans to leave. I don't think she's quite out of her days yet. I'm distancing myself as much as I can. We only talk if she initiates, and it's about the house, kids, or money. Trust me, she's starting to get it. She might expect me to act like nothing happened or to do the pick-me dance. In the past, that's what happened. I didn't really stand up to her or assert my demands to stay together. 
I was content to let it slide with a few apologies and a bit of excess. Now I'm doing my best to distance myself, minimizing communication to essential matters. No chit-chat, no asking how she's doing, no talking about our day. None of that. I think she's having a hard time with my hands-off approach. She's incapable of accepting blame for her actions and chooses to play the sufferer. It's a bit sad that she doesn't realize why this situation is entirely her responsibility. I know the why may never be answered, but the questions will always remain. Tonight was good. We went to my youngest daughter's high school musical. It was fun, but my wife sat next to my mom, who doesn't know about the affair. During the show, the other betrayed spouse texted me. Memories haunt me, and every time I wishfully hope we can stay together, I think about how I would just be in the same situation again in a few months. I'm more and more resolved on divorce. I know it sounds silly at this point. It should be absolutely unquestionable and the only way forward, but I still reflect on our life and family, wishing we could fix everything and move on. Those moments, however, are fleeting. I guess it's part of the process, because they only last for a few moments before reality reasserts itself. She's not worth staying with. I think that's progress. The question has been asked here so many times. Why? What has caused this seemingly normal person, brought up in a Christian home and proud of her Christianity, to do something so utterly abhorrent to the very morals she learned from childhood? Why? The big finale happened tonight. I tracked her to a parking lot where her car sat for a while. Then she went to a store and returned to the lot. As she sat there, I wondered what the hell is going on. I figured she was with him, so I want to check it out. Sure enough, there was her car, parked right next to his. I called his wife, who I've been talking to for a few days, and she suggested I go say hi and grab a picture. So I did. I told my wife not to come home tonight. Afterwards, she called me in tears, saying she was sorry. I agreed to let her come and grab her things, so she could be gone for a while. Now, all questions are answered, and the story has been written. On to the next phase of this journey, but not so fast. The DNA results from my three children had been sitting in the storage area where we keep our mail. I'd already forgotten about them. They'd been there for a couple of weeks. I don't receive a lot of paper mail, so I forgot to check. Maybe I didn't care to check because I thought they were all mine. Unfortunately, my first son isn't mine. I was so shocked to my core. I didn't expect that. She must have been cheating on me during the first years of our marriage. My heart is shattered into pieces, and I know I have to break the sad news to my children. I'm not going to hide secrets from my kids, so I told my son last night. There were lots of hugs, lots of crying. My soon-to-be ex-wife was still out of the house since I caught her having an affair with her partner in his car. He's not my biological son, but I've raised him, so he is mine. He's 20 now, and a man any father would be proud of. He's not ready to confront his mom yet. I called my soon-to-be ex-wife and told her. All she did was cry and apologize. She said she wanted to come home, but I told her it would be best if she stayed wherever she is for the foreseeable future. Truth be told, I feel pretty good. DNA or not, he's still my son. I've never been this close to my kids, and I tell them I love them every day. I'm more relaxed now. It's over. No more lying. No more worrying. My kids and I are still recovering, but we're at peace. In the coming days, we'll go through our emotions, but I see a clear path out of this now.